Thank you, Chrissy. Hello, everyone. Appreciate your joining us today for our Secure Act briefing. Uh, I'm delighted today that we have two important speakers for you, Deb Walker. She is our National Director for Compensation and Benefits Planning on the tax side. Deb has worked inside and outside the IRS, has been dealing with compensation issues and employment issues from a tax perspective for many years. And Susan Tucker is our director for our, and runs our qualified plan administration services for our firm. Uh, Susan and her team are dealing every day with employment pl employers and uh, benefit plans, both of for retirement plans as well as other benefit plans. So delighted to have their input and their perspectives on the SECURE Act. And when we talk about the SECURE Act, what we're really referring to is the Setting Every Community Up for Retirement Enhancement Act of 2019. And now this was a set of uh, proposals and a bill that was running around Congress for some time. Um, with these uh, improvements to retirement savings and incentives for employers to expand coverage for uh, more employees to participate in retirement savings plans and to improve some uh, flexibility and portability when it comes to these plans. And we'll highlight that. And as you may expect, it was also a pay for. Somebody has to pay for this. And so you'll see where uh, in the section discouraging post-death accumulations in these plans uh, where we'll talk about that, that uh, potential cost to pay for these other benefits. So the, uh, this bill was signed into law on December 20th, 2019. It came in as part of the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2020. Uh, that was a funding bill uh, mechanism and brought this change in as well as some uh, extensions to tax credits and a few other uh, provisions we call the the extenders. So with that in mind, I uh, want us to go ahead and get started on how the SECURE Act helps to encourage retirement savings. And Susan, I think you're going to start us off on this, talking about um, uh, the changes to 401k plans. I am. Thank you very much, Sarah. So currently, defined contributions have what's called a safe harbor provision. Certain ones do. Um, this allows and requires either certain matching contributions or a 3% employer contribution. This allows the employer to avoid discrimination testings. But prior to the SECURE Act, it required uh, an annual notice to the employees every year. Well, after 2019 and with the SECURE Act, the annual notice is no longer required to be distributed to the employees for safe harbor plans with a 3% employer contribution. You still are required to distribute the annual notice for the matching safe harbor, and you also have to continue uh, giving the initial notice to everybody in an initial safe harbor plan before they become eligible. But one of the big incentives and one of the nice things about this uh, SECURE Act is that you can now, if your plan is not a safe harbor plan and it is a tested plan, you can amend your plan up to at least 30 days before the end of your plan year to become a safe harbor, before the end of the plan year, I'm sorry. So if you are heading into um, – November, December, right before December 1st, and you feel like you're going to not pass your testing, you can amend your plan to be a 3% safe harbor and get out of your discrimination testing. You can also amend as late as the end of that current plan year, but your employer contribution is increased to 4% rather than the 3%. So these are big incentives to uh, change your plan from a tested plan to a safe harbor plan. And it's good because it gives you a little bit of flexibility. If your plan's not gonna pass testing and you have huge corrective refunds that are going back to your highly compensated employees, it may be better to um, initiate the safe harbor provisions. Another uh, nice incentive with the SECURE Act is that the automatic enrollment slash escalation plans that were put into place um, several years ago, and they, in, they definitely do encourage employee deferrals 
um, and participation and putting money away for retirement. Um, these were plans that the employees are there enrolled at a set percentage that's defined in the plan unless they actually opt out um, and or they change that percentage. So um, it used to start at a 3%. Um, it has now been changed to you can not start um, any, you can't go any higher than a 10% minimum deferral, but you can escalate it up to a 15%. So if you start at 10% for the first year, you can go up 1% every year uh, over the next five years and you know they'll go up to 15%. Um, the SECURE Act also gave you uh, a tax credit. Uh, it is for three years, $500 tax credit, if you add automatic enrollment to a new or existing plan, um, this is an annual tax credit, so it, you're looking at $1,500 in a tax credit that you could definitely enjoy. So one of the things, Susan, I, I think automatic enrollment is fantastic because as you say, it gets people savings if they never, saving, and if they never see the money, they are, tend to let it continue to accumulate and the escalation clauses are good. I think a lot of employers are a little nervous about auto enrollment because of the additional notice and if somebody wants to withdraw, they have to, you know, jiggle the payroll system and change it and, and there's more, I've heard some people complain that there's so many more room for errors and there's already a lot of room for error that they like to stay away from automatic enrollment, although I think that's really pretty unfortunate. Yeah, there's there's a lot of administrative uh, extra work with an automatic enrollment slash escalation plan, but it definitely does get people thinking about saving for their own retirement, and it actually gets a lot of people actually doing it. So um, it, it definitely is a uh, good fit for a lot of employers, um, and it definitely should be something that, you know, you, you may want to look into. Um, you know, we always recommend if if this is something that you're interested in, definitely talk to your third-party administrator on your retirement plan or uh, your tax advisor. So, um, one of the the big concerns for a lot of employers, and this has been brought up several times, has been what's called um, LTPTs, and these are your long-term part-time employees. Uh, in general, 401k plans usually have eligibility of age 21 and having to complete 1,000 hours of service during your first year. Um, and if you didn't do that, then you would be excluded from the plan. Um, after 2020 in the SECURE Act, long-term part-time workers have to be allowed to participate. And what they've done is they've defined a long-term part-time worker as anybody who's completed, oh, if you can go back, Sarah. Yeah, anybody who has completed three consecutive years of service, and what that is is that's at least 500 hours of service and age 21 at the end of the third year. Now, this will, we start counting these 500 hours uh, for three consecutive years starting in 2021. So if you have any employees who are working 500 hours uh, during a plan year, and, and you know, let's remember that you know, 40 hours a week or even 20 hours a week, which is part-time, over six months is going to get you, um, you know, well over the 500 hours. So you need to be careful with this. But starting in 2021, 2022, 2023, if you have employees who have worked at least those 500 hours during those three consecutive years, they're going to be eligible to participate and join your plan for deferral purposes starting 2024. So these people will vest in... Um, after their 500s, most vesting in plans are 1,000 hour plan years, but they will become vested at 500 hours uh, of service if the employer decides to make any employer contributions. Now, 
These long-term part-time employees, they have to be allowed to participate for 401k. They can be excluded from safe harbor provisions or employer matching or employer profit sharing. Um, if they are, they are not included in the non-discrimination testing um, for the plan. If you do decide to contribute for them in employer contributions, they'll vest after those 500 hours, okay? So I've heard a lot of complaints about this provision, although I, I again, think it's a very good provision. But a lot of people are concerned about, oh, some people I'm tracking 1,000 hours, some people I'm tracking 500 hours. And what some people are saying is it's just going to be easier to change my rules to the 401k plan for, to 500 hours of service instead of 1,000 hours. Of and, and that's, that's going to accelerate vesting, but... Yeah, and the thing that uh, is good, I mean, you want to encourage people to save for their retirement, to be able to defer. So a lot of the plans that we're seeing now are actually doing away with the one out, you know, the thousand hours, the one year of service, um, and doing, you know, maybe like a three months of service or uh, even 30 days or six months of service. Um, now, the other thing is that with these long term part time employees, you can still design a plan to exclude certain people from your plan. They've got to be a, a readily assertable. Uh, classification, and you still have to pass non-discrimination testing by excluding them, but it really, it, this is a good thing. I mean, you know, this is a good thing. You can exclude them from employer contributions. Um, so, you know, all you're doing basically is letting them defer, uh, which is a good thing. So, um, one of the the bigger things and, and getting a lot of press is about uh, distributions for the adoption or the birth of a child if your plan allows it. So um, this is will require an amendment and it definitely has to be written into the plan. But if you have um, a, a child within a year um, or adopt a child within a year, you have that year to take money out of your plan uh, up to $5,000 per individual, um, and that's for one child. Now, we, there's been a lot of discussion going on. Um, what happens if you have twins? Well, you actually get $10,000. You have the ability to take $10,000 out. Um, another thing is that if you know both the mother and the father are in the plan, they are both eligible to take $5,000 out each. Um, these distributions are not subject to the 10% uh, excise tax uh, on distributions before age 59 and a half. They will not be subject to the mandatory 20% withholding, but they are taxable to you. So even though you may take this money out, you still have to claim it on your income taxes as a taxable distribution. Now, the distributions can be repaid back to the plan at any time. So, you know, say you need the $5,000, you take it out, um, you know, 15 years later, you want to pay it back to the plan, you can pay it back. Now, the uh, adoption, they do have a caveat on the adoption that it, the child has to be younger than 18 or physically or mentally incapable of self-support. So you have to provide documentation on that. Um, this, plan, this provision, which is fantastic, it also applies to 403B plans and IRAs. So it definitely is, uh, you know, it can be a tax planning or a cash management um, provision that you definitely can utilize if the plan allows for it. All right. Can that I brings us yeah, I was going to say, let's go ahead and bring up our first polling question, and then, uh, Deb, you can tell us about uh, what what you have on mind, in mind. So our first polling question is, will the change to include long-term part-time workers impact your 401k plan, whether you are a person in charge of that plan or a participant in the plan? Do you think that this will impact your 401k plans?
So one of the things I was going to mention on the distribution for the birth of a child and the ability to repay that at any time is quite a problem for plans because they're worried about keeping the records for so long. Yes. Okay. Um, and while we're at it, we've had two questions come in. One is uh, the $500 tax credit for uh, setting up auto enrollment. Will that work with a simple IRA plan? And I'm going to have to check that. Okay. So we'll we'll follow up on that and see if we can't find that answer. I'm not sure if if it'll work. If it's um, if the if the employees have if you can set up an automatic withholding from the employee for contributions into that plan, it may qualify. Uh, then the next question is, what about a Roth IRA? Is the early distribution um, not taxable from a Roth? Is there a distinction between a traditional IRA and a Roth IRA when it comes to the, um, uh, when it comes to the distribution for adoption or birth expenses? Okay, so the, the we're still waiting on a lot of guidance from the Department of Labor and the IRS. Um, right now, if your distribution is ta money taken out of Roth, um, the money that was put in as Roth is not taxable, obviously. The earnings, which would be taxable um, because it's prior to age 59, it is still taxable, um, It you, but you don't have the 10% um, excise tax on it. Um, I would probably think that a lot of the plans will be written to not allow that money coming out um, of Roth just because of that issue. All right, Chrissy, I think we're done with this polling question and let's go back and I think Deb, you're going to talk about defined contribution plans for us. I am. I am. The uh, defined contribution plan rules it, um, have changed favorably from the standpoint that you don't have to take required minimum distributions, this applies to IRAs also, until April 1st following the year that you reach age 72, assuming um, that you turn 70 and a half after uh, December 31st, 2019. So depending on when your birthday is, you either are under the required minimum distribution rules as they exist today, beginning at age 70 and a half, or uh, beginning at age 72. The next thing that changed was the benefit statements are going to be required to include disclosure of lifetime income at least once every 12 months. Now this is interesting because it's been around as a problem for a very for a controversial issue because nobody really believes that it's some people argue that it's not a good idea to tell somebody that if they contribute to this plan when they're age 35 um, then when they reach age 70 they're going to get 10 cents a week for the rest of their lives and because they believe that that will discourage savings instead of encouraging savings. Notwithstanding that, we've now passed a law that says you must have a disclosure of lifetime income at least once every 12 months, beginning with one year after the Department of Labor issues guidance with a model disclosure to be released 12 months after the statute was passed. And what it's going to say is the monthly lifetime income stream you will get either as a single life or joint and survivor annuity. There are some other rules for ERISA plans. Um, one, which is very favorable, and it, it sort of goes along with the correction for the safe harbor rule that Susan talked about. But after 19, plans can be adopted up until the extended due date of the employer's income tax returns. So that's a very favorable change in my mind because when you're preparing your tax return for 2020 in the spring of 21 and you find out your income is a lot greater and you wished that you had adopted a profit sharing plan to share with your employees, you can adopt that plan and make a contribution and take claim it on the tax return that you're currently preparing. Now, people are a little worried that 
defined benefit plans could be a problem because of you might be filing your tax return as late as October, and yet defined benefit plans need to have their contributions funded by uh, September. That's, a, to me, a, t a tweak. If you're going to do a defined benefit plan, you'll be advised that you can't do it effectively after uh, September 15th because you'll miss the funding deadline. But other than that, and then, you know, unfortunately, 401k plans have to allow for elective deferrals during the year. So you won't be, you can put in a 401k plan in the spring of 2021. People can reduce their salary in 2021. But, and you could also have a profit sharing component where you took a deduction in 2020. But you can't go back and, and have a 401k salary reduction amount after the year is closed, obviously, because everybody's paychecks have already been paid. Uh, the last bullet on this slide is really pretty technical. It's just that you need to make, you have until the first plan year beginning after 2021 to make amendments to your plan. But of course, you have to operate in accordance with any of the law changes. And um, when any amendments are made, you can't um, violate a cutback rule, anti-cutback rules. Okay, so we also had some concerns that people don't want to annuitize benefits in their plan. So assume your business is shutting down, you don't have many employees, you've got a retirement plan, but you really wish you didn't have to run this plan anymore, you're not contributing to it. And so you, what you want to do is turn over the benefits for everybody to an annuity provider. And people were very nervous that you might pick an insurance company who then went out of business. And, you know, maybe the insurance companies that are the most risky insurance companies are the ones that are going to give you the best deal in purchasing these annuities. So there have been some law changes to uh, provide that as long as you engage in an objective, thorough, analytical search and you consider people's financial capabilities, evaluate the cost of the contract in relation to benefits, and if you conclude that the insurance insurer is financially capable of satisfying the obligation and the contract cost is reasonable, then the prudent man rule is satisfied, and you're not concerned with that. There's a big caveat to this, which is the prudent man doesn't extend to the contract itself. So when you're going to annuitize benefits out of your plan to get rid of the requirements to maintain the plan, you have to evaluate not only the insurance company that's providing the annuity contracts, but you have to evaluate the contract itself. And none of these changes have to do with the contract. So it's a separate analysis, and you have to get, still go through that analysis. Notwithstanding, this does provide benefits to, to help people um, in, those, in that situation. Okay, a few other little changes that we really don't need to spend very much time on at all. Um, which is defined benefit plan in service distributions now can come at age 59 and a half instead of at age 62. Lifetime, this one is interesting. Um, a lot of people invest in lifetime income investments, uh, age, age, um, mutual funds, targeted mutual funds. And the problem was that sometimes the investment provider would not offer these anymore, and yet people couldn't withdraw the amounts. So what this does is if the investment is no longer going to be able to be held in the plan, it can be paid in a trustee-to-trustee -trustee transfer or an annuity within 90 days to another vehicle which will be treated as a plan. So it lets people get lifetime income investments out of a plan without having to liquidate those investments. Um, the next one is no credit card loans from plans. This has been very controversial, and this is effective immediately, very controversial that uh, plans were just running loan programs um, so that people were taking loans very frequently from plans. Caused a lot of administrative problems, but it also reduced the amount of savings people had. So uh, a lot of the people that worked with plans didn't really like credit card loans being available. Uh, and then the last one is if you have a frozen or closed defined benefit plan, what happens there is those plans tend to uh, 
in their later life, if you will, when they're frozen and then the employees start leaving, it's the older, higher paid employees that continue. And some of those plans can't pass discrimination rules. So there have been some relief given for those plans, which I think, okay. Sarah, brings us to our next attendance, attendance check. check. Sarah? Uh, yes. So our second question, will the new guidance under the prudent man rule encourage the use of annuities in plans? What do you think? Yes, no, or not sure? Uh, Deb, we did have one question just as a follow-up. So if you put in a plan in place after your year ends, uh, can you offer deferrals, as the slide says? No, you can you offer deferrals for the current year. You make a profit sharing contribution in the for the prior year. Yes, there is a, the plan can be designed for profit sharing, say for 2020, but elective deferral would not be effective until, um, say, like March 1 or, or March 15th now, since we're already into March 1. Okay, great. All right, Chrissy, I think we are ready to move on. Okay, so the next thing is um, simplification for filing Form 5500. And I guess this can go two ways, as Susan and I were talking about it in preparing for this slide for presentation. Um, so after 2020, you can file just one 5500 for all your plans that are defined contribution plans with the same trustee, the same fiduciary, the same administrator, plan years beginning on the same date, and providing these same investments. So this will, to the extent you have a lot of little plans, it'll save money on, or a lot of big plans that are over 100, 120 participants and have to have an audit. It will save money on how many audits you have to have because you'll have just one audit. Um, to the That depends, I guess, on how long um, how much your auditors are, how divided up the assets are, and how that saves money on the audit fees. But in any event, on the other hand, if you have a lot of small plans, you might not want to aggregate them because by aggregating them, you may put yourself into a situation where, in fact, you do need an audit when you would rather not have to have an audit. Um, talking about filing Form 5500, uh, and understanding, of course, that these rules did need some pay-fors, one of the things that have, that have been used typically as pay-fors are the penalties. So we have penalties increased for filing Form 5500, for not filing Form 5500. Now it's up to $250 a day, up to $150,000. I can't stress enough how important it is to file your Form 5500s and file it on time. Even if you can't get your audit report completed, file it on and time. Deb, this is also, this is the, um, this is just one of the penalties. There is also, um, you know, the DOL penalty and the IRS penalties for failing to file a 5500. So, uh, yeah, definitely file your 5500 and file it on time. Right. So there are all, I wanted to highlight on the slide that the delinquent filer program is still available, and that will lower the penalties. So uh, sometimes, especially in acquisition situations, and especially with things like health plans, we find situations where three, four, five years of plan re filing requirements haven't been met. And in that case, it really makes a lot of sense to go into the delinquent filer program. With the increase in penalties, it, it makes even more sense to go into the delinquent filer program. The next slide outlines just a couple other penalties that are emphasizing how important it is to make these filing requirements. We have a form 8955, which if somebody retires from your uh, company and they don't get their benefit out of the plan, they have what's called a deferred vested benefit. And it used to be that the penalty for not filing this form was, um, and enlisting all the people on the form and what their deferred vested benefit was, was $1 for an unreported participant per day up to $5,000. Uh, 
Now it's $10 for an unreported participant per day, up to $50,000. And there's also a withholding notice for distributions. And this is one I think that is missed a lot. Um, but in any event, you need to give a, a notice that people can waive withholding when they get retirement plan distributions. And this was $10 a day up to 5000 Now it's $100, excuse me, $10 per notice up to 5000 And now it's $100 per notice up to $50,000. Um, moving off of qualified plans onto 403B plans, we have just a few things. This is interesting here because people that terminated 403B plans had problems because they didn't want to distribute out cash. They wanted to distribute out amounts in kind. And finally, the rules have been changed. Um, effective for plan years beginning after 2008, um, which says that amounts can be distributed in kind and maintained in a custodial account with all the same rules. It won't be a 403B plan anymore, but it will have many of the same rules, and it's not considered um, distributed. And then finally, um, employees of non-qualified church-controlled entities and ministers can participate in 403B plans. So let's move on to IRAs. Um, this is a favorable provision. Now we have no limit in in uh, contributing to an IRA. So as long as you're working after age 70 and a half and you make enough to contribute to an IRA, you make five, $6,000, whatever you want to put into the IRA, then you can contribute that to an IRA. That avoids the tax on the income and it it um, accumulates income tax-free or, or and maybe gives you a deduction. Now, one of the things that people don't like about this is that the IRA qualified charitable distribution, so people that are over age 70 and a half can distribute amounts from their IRA directly to a charity, and this means that they don't have to take the amounts into income, and the charitable contribution deduction is not um, tested through the percentage of income limitations for an individual taxpayer. So. Um, I'm going to go through an example, but just before I do that, just to finish on this slide, not only did they change the no age limit for contributing to an IRA, but they also expanded the amounts that can be contributed. So if you have a taxable fellowship or a stipend, graduate students, medical students, all of those people can now use that kind of income to contribute as compensation for an IRA. And if you're a foster parent with um, diff receiving difficulty of care payments, that's a special kind of foster parent payment, then you can use the difficulty of care payments in order to contribute to an IRA. So let's go back to this charitable contribution thing because it's kind of hard to understand. And let me tell you why the government made this. What the government didn't want to do was let you have the opportunity to, to deduct a contribution into an IRA and immediately turn around and distribute that contribution to a charity without taking the amount into income. So they had, and, and when the rule was that you couldn't contribute to the IRA and after 70 and a half, they didn't have to worry about that because the charitable contribution rule didn't apply until after 70 and a half. But now, since anybody, owe, anybody can contribute to an IRA, let's assume I'm 72 and I contribute $5,000 when I'm 72 and when I'm 73. And then when I'm 79, I decide to give $30,000 to a charity and I just tell my IRA trustee to transfer the $30,000. It's not income to me. I don't get a deduction for the $30,000. However, because I made a contribution to my IRA after I was 70 and a half, my charitable contribution deduction is now going to be only 20000 not 30000 for that transfer. So when I was thinking about this, now I think I would advise an individual taxpayer, well, we better look at the opportunities for giving appreciated stock versus using an IRA to make a charitable contribution. And that's something you have to look at individually to see how it will work. I guess this brings us up to discouraging post-death distributions, and this is the one that's gotten a lot of attention. Um, so what, uh, what is a stretch IRA? 
a stretch IRA is an IRA that's required to make dinner distribution. So it's somebody who is either age 72 or 70, 70 and a half. And the distributions are made over the individual's life expectancy and the life expectancy of another person. So what everybody would do or many people would do in what they call that stretch IRA is granddad who was age 70 and a half would designate grandchild who was age two as the beneficiary. Granddad might live another 20 years. The beneficiary then is the beneficiary when they're turning 22 and they get the assets over their life expectancy. So it was a way to really spread out the payments to the to out of an IRA. And by spreading the payments out of the IRA, they were essentially letting the IRA ballots continue to build tax-free over a number of, of years. Um, so this was the big revenue raiser for the SECURE Act. And basically what it said is, that retired, the entire account must be paid for people dying after 2019, must be paid out by the end of the 10th year following the account holder's death, and there are some exceptions to that. Um, but generally, a grandchild is not going to be an exception. Even a child is not, uh, usually not an exception. So who, what are the exceptions? The exceptions are a spouse, a minor child, that's a minor child of yours, not a minor child, which is your grandchild, a disabled individual, <clears throat> a chronically ill individual, or somebody who's less than or equal to 10 years younger than the account old, holder. So if you don't have a spouse, you might want to give it to a sister or a brother that's eight years younger than you are, and that's perfectly acceptable, and then don't have to worry about the 10-year payout. It, if you don't have to apply the 10-year payout, you apply the old rule, which is a life expectancy rule. So if you, an IRA owner can give an IRA to their brother who's eight years younger, and that will go out over the joint life expectancy of the owner and the brother who's eight years younger. Um, I did go and look at one and an example for one thing, so you can see the magnitude of the changes. Assume somebody at age 85 dies, leaving an IRA to a grandson who's then age 21. Under the old law, the distributions after death would be taken out over 62 years. Under the new law, the distributions have to come out under 10 years, over 10 years. So you can see there's 52 years in this example where income, where assets will not be held in a tax exempt trust and will not be accumulating income tax free. So that's why this is such an important um, provision that people are not really very fond of. <laughs> um, so what can you do? Well, first of all, a spouse can always elect to treat an IRA as their own account. So when my husband passes away, I can elect to take his IRA, treat it as mine, and I get to take it out over my life expectancy and appoint another beneficiary. And the beneficiary is going to have, my new beneficiary is going to have to meet the 10-year rule or maybe be one of the accepted class. But it's even more important now because of, the elimination of the stretch IRA, that the spouse be the sole beneficiary so that you can elect, the spouse can treat the IRA as their own. This crazy rule, everybody's asking for it to be changed because the spouse has to be the sole beneficiary and it can go through a spouse a trust in some cases, but there have to be specific trust provisions. And um, the, the point is, if, in fact, you don't have your spouse as a beneficiary of your IRA, you want to go back and look at that. Um, the other thing is, for, for more elderly clients, then you might want to change the beneficiary to somebody other than an eligible designated beneficiary to make sure that it can go out over at least 10 years. So in this case, I'm saying, well, let's say you have two parties that are 90 and a, and um, a spouse that's 94, well, the life expectancy for those two people could be less than the 10-year period. 
So that's why you want to make sure that's why you want to make that uh, change to get it over at least the 10 year period. I, it's very hard to be more specific than this with respect to this type of planning because it depends on your other assets, your age, your health, who your beneficiaries are. The thing that people have been saying is, of course, consider charitable remainder trust because the charitable remainder trust could avoid this 10-year rule. Uh, trust for disabled people, but I don't think you want to become disabled just to get a trust. And the last one is if you have trust provisions that trust that are receiving your required minimum distributions, you need to review those trust provisions. Some of those trust provisions flow the money out from the IRA into the trust and immediately out. And though, without changing those trust provisions, you might be required to, in fact, give money out sooner to the trust beneficiaries than it was intended. So, um, that's something that you should definitely be looking at. So with that, Sarah, I think we're up into. We are at our next polling question, which is true or false. All IRAs must now be paid out over 10 years after an owner's death. True or false. Uh, Deb, we did have one question come in and ask, uh, what if you already have an existing IRA paying out to um, a post-death beneficiary? Uh, are they subject to this new 10-year rule, or is it only for decedents passing away or beneficiaries after the date of enactment? After December 31st, 19. It's decedents passing away after December 31st, 19. The only thing is um, that once the, I think once the beneficiary dies after that, um, the 10 year rule may kick into play. So I'm not sure in the question whether the, the individual is a, is a beneficiary or an account owner. But it applies to people dying after 1231-19. All right, that is great. Um, so we are, if you guys are wrapping up that poll question, we'll be ready to start on our uh, next section here. Um, so let's go ahead and Chrissy, thank you. Okay, so we have just real quick, and this there's two small business credits. We've talked about one of them already, the automatic enrollment credit of $500 per year for three years. If you have never had a plan before in the past three years, then they're gonna, and you have less than 100 employees, and you set up a plan, then you can get a credit, which is the greater of $500 or $250 times the number of non-highly compensated people in your plan up to $5,000. So if you've never had a plan before, you have less than, 000, uh, less than 100 people, this is definitely something you want to look at. This is a $5,000 credit. It goes for three years, so it could be $15,000 um, to get you to set up a retirement plan. And the amount of the credit is driven off of the number of non-highly compensated employees that you have. Uh, the other thing is that the uh, family medical leave credit was extended for an additional year to the end of 2020. This is 50% of wages paid for at least two years for somebody out on family and medical leave. It does require a written plan. It does require that benefits be paid to all employees, even a pro rata benefit to uh, part-time employees. So very few people do actually qualify for this credit, uh, and now it's been ex it was in place for 2018, 2019, and now it goes for 2020. So one more year of the credit, unless you've already been claiming it, I don't think is going to encourage people to adopt those so types of benefits. Benefit. We'll see. Uh, Deb, we had one question here on the adding automatic enrollment. That is a $500 per plan credit, not related to number of employees or workers, is that correct? That's correct, yes. So we had a few changes to the ACA provisions. We had uh, some of the provisions in ACA were, which actually never came into play in many cases because they were postponed. The Cadillac tax, medical device, and the health insurer fee have all been repealed. Unfortunately, the PCORI tax, which did go into play and was supposed to expire in 2020, has now been extended, 
And this is a, a tax that's paid by insurers and paid by self-insured plans of $2.45 per participant. That was the amount last year. Uh, it's filed on Form 720, and it's due in July of 31. That has um, been extended now till 2025, I think. Um, anyway, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Susan. Great. And Susan, we had one follow-up question. I think we've had a couple of questions about this um, credit for the creating the automatic enrollment for plans. And so if you, if I understand this right, if you have a plan with uh, an existing plan and you add the automatic enrollment, then uh, you could be eligible for a $500 tax credit to use against uh, the, the employer's income taxes. Uh, but it's not based on the number of participants. It's not based on highly compensated or not compensated. It is just um, if you add that feature to your plan. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Now to talk about everybody's absolute favorite, MEPs and PEPs. So a MEP is a multiple employer plan, and a PEP is a pooled employer plan. So prior to um, before SECURE Act, employers were allowed to band together um, and consolidate uh, and adopt one plan and file um, 5500s and be considered a quote, single employer, um, if they had a common bond. Um, now, unrelated employers will be allowed to participate in what's called an open multiple employer plan or an open MEP. Um, and the open MEP can be considered a PEP or a pooled employer plan. And it's treated as a single employer plan if the plan uses a pooled plan provider, or a PPP. Um, this is, a, a pooled plan provider is one that is responsible for performing all of the administrative duties necessary to ensure um, both ERISA and the IRS compliance. If you are a, an unrelated group of employers and you have this multiple employer plan, um, and you employ or hire uh, a pooled plan provider, you will be considered to be having a PEP. Um, the SECURE Act allows a MEP to be sponsored by a pooled plan provider, and it includes employers that don't have a common bond. So you can have a car dealership and an office supply uh, business and a flooring company. Um, and, you know, they have no common bond other than the fact that they've adopted the same plan. And you can now become a MEP. And if you're sponsored by a pooled plan provider, you become a PEP. Um, one of the benefits of that is that um, there's going to be new Form 5500 providing uh, reporting requirements, and your pool plan provider has to have, it has to be the named fiduciary, has to be a plan administrator, and it's a person who's responsible for all of your administrative duties. Um, the employer continues to be the plan sponsor of their portion of the plan, but they just have what I call a higher power that controls everything. Um, prior to the SECURE Act, if you were in a MEP and one of the plans or one of the providers um, did something bad, they became what was called a one bad apple, um, that would have a tendency and, and was actually tainting the entire MEP. Well, now, if you are a PEP and you're in a pooled plan provider usage, and you have that one bad apple, the plan is not tainted. Just that one part of the plan is bad, 
and what they do is they section it off, they they transfer it off, they um, send it to no man's land. They actually send it to another plan provider, and it doesn't contain or contaminate your full map. So it, there is some pr uh, protection, and that is actually providing a lot of um, liability, responsibility, disqualification issues for um, the plan. So, you know, it, it's good if you're in these MEPs and you have this one bad apple, you can section that bad apple off and your your plan is still in good shape, okay? The non-compliant employer is liable for any of the plan liabilities that have to do with their section, but the ones that were compliant, they're not responsible for that non-compliant person. So that definitely gives you some protection. Um, MEPs and PEPs um, are, they're a big thing. Um, they are the, the talk of the qualified plan world. They will either be the next big thing or they will be the next really bad thing. So you either, uh, everybody that you talk to, they have a very strong opinion as to, yes, they're great, or no, they're horrible. Um, there, there doesn't seem like there's any um, in between. But they're definitely a protection and a planning um, component that, you know, you may want to start looking into. Uh, again, we recommend that you talk to your third-party administrator or your uh, tax planner. Um, they will definitely have some um, thoughts and, and uh, some recommendations. Um, so, Susan, the, I can mean, I, the idea yeah. is for, for this to save you money. By pulling yes. together, you'll get uh, economies of scale. And to relieve the small employer of having to deal with plan administration. And Correct. I think and all you know, the big... Yeah, you used to see a lot of the MEPs for, like, the car dealerships because all the car dealerships would would blend together and they would have one MEP. And as long as you had that common bond, you were allowed to do that. So now you can have an uncommon bond and have a MEP and, and band together and get the lower fees, the lower uh, compliance fees, um, you know, and, and stand up against, uh, you know, big costs. So... Um, it's definitely something that you you may want to look into. And I think it's uh, it's the big insurance companies, the big financial institutions, the big brokerage houses. All of them are going to sponsor these open, what we call open maps. Correct. Uh, With that, it brings up our last polling question for today, which is: Do you see potential benefits? Oh, participating in a multi-employer plan. Yes, no, or not sure uh, with that. Oh, oh. And so, Sarah, I was able to check the uh, statute while Susan was talking about whether the automatic enrollment uh, credit applied to simple plans and to SEPs, and it does apply to a simple K plan, a SEP, any of those. That's great. Thank you very much. So that answers uh, one of the last remaining questions we had. Uh, if you have any more questions, go ahead and put them in the pool while we uh, take a look at this last uh, poll here. And um, so Deb or and Susan, uh, give us give us your last thoughts on uh, the advantages you see of the Secure Act and where you think um, uh, most much going to be happening this year. I think the biggest thing is it's not an advantage, it's a disadvantage, but we're going to have a lot of people spending time thinking about who their beneficiaries of their IRAs are, of their retirement plans, because of this 10-year rule and the elimination of spreading it out over the life expectancy of your even your children, let alone your grandchildren. So that will be a lot of activity. I think there'll be additional savings with the fact that more people can have IRAs, since you don't have any age limit on contributing, you can take taxable scholarships into account. It's a great way to set up um, for younger people the, uh, a contribution to a Roth IRA, say, if all they have is a taxable scholarship. 
Yeah, and, and I think I think a lot of the advantages to the Secure Act uh, with qualified plans is one, you can change a tested plan to a, th a three percent safe harbor uh, within you know thirty days before the end of the plan year, or uh, go to a four percent safe harbor all the way up to the end of the plan year uh, that you know following that plan year. Um, also, that you can actually put a new plan in place up to the due date of your uh, tax return. Uh, I think that that definitely will help. Um, the auto escalation and automatic enrollment uh, increase, uh, definitely, you know, maxing that out at 15% rather than at 10% uh, will uh, hopefully encourage folks to save more. Um, but yeah, th those are those are the big the big hot topics for us. Um, the RMDs at 72 rather than 70 and a half is uh, uh, another uh, another big push with uh, not only IRAs but with the qualified plans. All right, great. Well, we are almost to the top of our top of the hour here. So thank you, Deb, and thank you, Susan, for your insights. And we appreciate all your questions. If you have more, you have the uh, email addresses for both Deb and Susan. Please reach out to them and, and ask them your questions. And thank you for attending today. Uh, Chrissy, any final words? <laughs> 